In terms, I'm going to now with the remaining time, let's walk through some programs. Sure. Um, Tony Fakos is leaving. Yes, he is. When is that? His uh, retirement date is June 30th. Uh, he will have been with the department for 35 years, something like that. He's been chief for 12, done a fantastic job. I want to talk briefly about Tony. He uh, has, you know, he inherited a good department. He's really turned into a great department. Uh, he has, he, he is committed to this community. He's committed to quality policing. Uh, he's brought this, uh, the policy of 21st century policing and really embedded that in our, our police department. And, uh, what is 21st century policing? It's a term that was developed actually when uh, President Obama was in office. He created a task force on law enforcement and they developed a, a theory of policing which they call 21st century policing. It's got six pillars and you know, training, uh, community relations, uh, po good policies, uh, uh, accountability, integrity. So yeah, I can't name them all. He could, I'm sure. And so you build your, your department policies around those six pillars. And a, a real important one is interaction with the community. And you see us doing things like coffee with the cop. We've got the, the bike patrol. We've got folks out talking. I noticed uh, I took a picture actually during the holidays. A couple of our officers were out with Santa hats on, you know, directing. It's, and I think it's those kind of things that helps build a relationship with the community so that they trust the police in times of Is there anything on the margin in the police budget embedded in this? Any initiatives, anything new other than some equipment possibly? Not real, well, no, that is, uh, yes. In the budget is a um, funding for a shared social worker with Barry. Um, so, and so Barry would put in money, we would put in money, and- I think the state is. And the state's putting the state in money, yeah. And that would pr help uh, assist in some calls and cases when we don't necessarily need a law enforcement uh, response or we need someone with specialized knowledge to help guide. One of the things we've really prided ourselves uh, in, in Montpelier is our, our capacity interaction with the mental health community. I think if you talk to Washington County Mental Health, they would sing the praises of Montpelier PD. There's a required, uh, or there is a, a, a team, what they call team two training for police officers for dealing with mental health emergencies. And we were the first in the state to be 100% uh, team two trained. And we've, you know, that is our standard, and we are continuing that because we we want to be on, on the top of the game, uh, dealing with those situations. But a social worker would also really assist us in a lot of, uh, you know, situations where we need extra expertise. The policeman in the school is still written into the budget. Yes, has that changed? That That's his police woman in the school now. Is it okay? Sorry, I usually call it the cop in the school, yeah. which would cover both. Um, is the policewoman in the school's role the same that it's been in the past? Yes, yes. Uh, school resource officer is actually the, the title and it's shared with the police, uh, shared 50-50 between the schools and the police, and they interact, they're in the buildings, they interact with um, students, they help, whether it's with individual cases, family needs, they get information, and then obviously when school's not in session, they're working for the, the police department. This is a difficult question. I've never asked you this one before, but I always ask the schools, um, do you feel safe in City Hall? Do you feel that people are, feel, st I always ask that, you know, going into the schools, screening for the schools. We don't screen in City Hall at mm -hmm. all. No, we don't, and it, you know, I'd say generally we feel safe, I feel safe. Um, it has come up, ever, ever, it's come up off and on over the years, it, particularly after the tragic shooting in Virginia Beach a couple years ago at, at municipal City, employee. a municipal employee and other municipal employees. We have been, we have had, uh, a request for training and for uh, security measures, and we are uh, evaluating those. The training has actually been scheduled. Uh, we've done a training for the city council uh, in the past. We will need to do a new one with the new group uh, should someone come into the council chamber during a meeting. Um, but it, it's frightening times. Uh, the fire department, any changes there? Not really. I think the most exciting thing that's going on with the fire department is their move to paramedic service. That is a new and enhanced uh, capacity that we'd not had before. And uh, I think Chief Gowns has been very wise. He, um, they've set a long-term goal of, to have the department be 100% paramedics. We used to have the top, EMTI was the highest rating. So that every shift could be covered paramedic? Well, and eventually every person right. would be a paramedic. But right now we have four, so we've got about 25% of the department. So what we're doing is as someone leaves, 
when we rehire, we seek to go to a paramedic, and we're also offering some in training for those in-house that want to get. This is a much more, much, much, much more advanced uh, medical training than our EMTs. There's, you know, it's pretty extensive classes, and you have to, you know, learn to, to, uh, you know, do intravenous drugs, those kinds of things. It's, it's uh, important, but it's also life-saving, uh, and. Um, you know, Barry's had a paramedic program for a while, and we were seeing enough calls where we felt the need here, but we also, um, from a financial management standpoint, didn't want to suddenly, you know, first of all, we wouldn't have been able to just, what we can do with the 16 people we had, just get rid of them all, bring in, right. you know, right. hire them. So we've opted for this incremental approach. It's working very well, and um, we're looking forward to that growing in the future. Public Works. We have uh, Tom McArdle left after during this year from the last time you and I spoke. Yeah, Tom's another one I could talk for hours about. He knows every little uh, nick and, nook and cranny of the city, where every wire is, and every easement and right of way. Fortunately, Tom retired as public works director and is coming back as a part-time project manager for us. So he'll be doing the things I think that he really likes to do, which is get projects done and work with contractors and do those kinds of things and not do the things like go to council meetings and talk to the press and handle emergencies and deal with personnel issues and those kinds of things. So uh, that'll be great. We've, uh, we also had Brian Tuttle retire, who was uh, the superintendent, uh, operational superintendent. And, Lost uh, a lot of capital, the human capital. Yeah, we sure have. Well, we are, you know, as you mentioned, the police chief as well as Captain Martell is also retiring. Uh, we've seen a lot of, of those changes. Todd Preventure, our finance director, left. Um, Jeff Byer, our parks director, retired. Our, uh, Sue Allen, our assistant city manager, left. So, but we've replaced everybody with really great folks. And in DPW in particular, I think we are looking at the opportunity to... Well, that's Donna Barlow. Donna Casey. Barlow Casey is the new director of public works. Kurt Modica was promoted to deputy director. Zach Blodgett was promoted from an engineer to an operations manager and engineer. And the, the team is really looking at how they can best manage and provide services in a, you know, maybe more modern ways. But, and, but you know, you still got to plow the roads. You still got to fix the. But didn't they do a, a shift of one person from supervisory to actual getting out there? And, yes, and, and, and getting their hands right. really For, into it. Yes, uh, and and that is part of it. So they were, we are hiring new people. We've had a couple. We actually also had a, an employee retire, uh, a line employee. So we're going to fill that position and fill. Uh, the newly created position in the budget. So, uh, w the idea was to get more boots on the ground, so to speak, to handle the, the, the work that DPW does. Again, some of those other grants, uh, the uh, Community uh, Human Services Board. Um, Community Justice Center? No, no, uh, the one that gives out the grants to uh, agencies. Oh, oh, the Community Fund. The Community yes. Fund. Is that the same amount as last year? Uh, it's actually slightly less. Uh, they, it, it's you know approximately the same. They came in. Um, we've it took us a little while to sync up the timing of these processes so that we, we were getting the right funding in the budget for the requests, and I think we managed to, to work that pretty well. So they notified us probably in December as we were putting our numbers together that they were planning to recommend awards that were just slightly less than the prior year, so we just put in the number that they were going to award. Uh, the Housing Trust Fund, how did that fare? Last year, we, it rose up to 110000 from sixty, and it stayed at 110000 this year. Uh, obviously, new housing is a, is a prime goal for the community, uh, uh, really f for all, uh, from, from low-end housing to high-end housing. And these funds have been really instrumental in um, plugging project holes and uh, you know I think the uh, we committed funds for example for the the French block those 18 units of apartments there and the, the French block being where right across the street from City Hall above Obashans those uh, apartments that have been empty for 80 years that are now full and brand new and lovely and um, tax paying and so and we did add apartments above the transit center. correct and uh, and our housing trust fund was also helpful there so it, you know for the amount of money we put in, we're never going to build a housing project, but we help leverage uh, grant funds and, and make applications stronger if there's some local dollars that are attached with state, you know, with other monies. Well, pay your life. 
How did they fare? Same as last year, uh, which had been an increase. They, they, they got a $10,000 increase last year, so that stayed at, at the higher level. And, uh, you know, I think they're very well uh, received at, uh, in City Hall and clearly in the downtown. They do a lot for the community, provide a lot of events, a lot of uh, support in different ways. And uh, we're, you know, we're happy to partner with them. We're happy, you know, one of, the th one of our contributions, of course, is uh, in addition to the finance, direct finances, is providing them office space in City Hall. The Development Corporation, the Montpelier Development Corporation, where we keep losing directors through no fault of our own. Yeah, you know, that's a really sad situation. They've had three great directors, and all three of them left for completely understandable reasons, uh, none of which had to do with the job or Montpelier. Uh, but it doesn't help, the, you know, it doesn't help the, the corporation any. Um, but they were, their funding was re retained at the same level. Now, their level. funding is different than, it's not coming out of the general tax pool. Well, yes. Uh, so the, the local options tax is uh, funding economic development and capital spending. That said, we have the revenues on this side and the expenditures on this side, so right. it's all pooled. So it's pool. all pooled, pooled. But yeah, um, you know, when they, when the MDC was formed and the the economic development strategic plan was created, the city council made the then city council made a five year commitment to fund MDC. This is year four, and although the the makeup of the council has changed substantially, I think. They all felt, uh, it appeared that they felt that, you know, if the city makes commitments, it's, it's important to honor them, otherwise who's going to want to deal with the city? And so uh, they, they supported the funding, and next year will be the fifth year, and then we'll see where we go after that. Boy, this is very possibly another show, or no show, no another show, Green Mountain Transit. It, well, uh, you know, the circulator in the light. Yeah, I think you should probably talk to people from Green Mountain Transit. I'm not the most knowledgeable but about it. They are in the budget. They are in the budget. Uh, we we have they're in the budget in two places. We we have a general allocation that we pay to, as members of Green Mountain Transit, that, that which is most like for the link and yeah that kind of thing. Well, and just for their right for their budget, then we pay an additional forty thousand dollars for the circulator. That's Green Mountain Transit is is looking at converting to something called on-demand transit or microtransit. What would that, just in, in two minutes, what would that be? Uh, That's either two minutes or an hour-long show. Right, well, I, I, I think it would be an interesting conversation to talk with people involved in transit. Essentially, I call it, you know, sort of government Uber, but you would call for a ride. You, you'd have an app, and you'd call for a ride, and it would be paid for with your tax dollars. It might not be quite as fast as Uber, but instead of waiting for the bus to circulate, they'd have smaller vehicles, and you might could, there be a copay? I don't know. I don't know. It depends. You know, some some of their funding comes from federal and state grants that don't allow copays. So if people say, "Oh, they should charge money," but sometimes they're prohibited. So it depends. I think what the funding package for this looks like. The city council is. We really support this. We think it could su support a wider range in, in the community, and we have said we would reallocate that forty thousand dollars to the micro transit program if that's the way it goes. This is the two minute version. Might I tell you that Donna Bate from the city council is the person who's really concerned with this, along with Connor yes. Casey on their show. They spend about 10 minutes yeah. talking about this subject, and we go into a lot more detail on this. Uh, but again, as they point out, this is speculative. We haven't been approved. But they do speak to what this might look like. And it's really, really, as Bill said, it's, it's a very interesting discussion. It is very interesting. And, and actually, they are the two people that are, are the city's reps to the committee that's looking at that. So they are more knowledgeable than I am about that. So I'm glad you talked to them about it. And then the final one is kind of the elephant in the room. The, the, when we talk about incremental budgeting, nobody comes in and says, well, we, you know, we need to do a massive rehaul of, of public works or the fire department or the police department. But you really caught a lot of attention with the 45000 for the homeless task force. Hmm. Could you explain what the 45000 for the homeless task force is about, what that purchases us, and what the accountability is on that spending? Um, well, it was a request from a task force to the council, so it didn't, you know, come through the manager's office. So we didn't do the normal level of, of 
in-depth vetting that we would do, not to say that it's inappropriate, but just... Now, what's the difference between a task force and a commission? Uh, task like force... planning commission or... Well, so the planning the commission, commission has very specific... Uh, has very specific statutorily defined duties, and so does you know development review board and those kind of things. This was a task force or an ad hoc committee, however you want to call it, set up by the council to take on a task to address homelessness in the community, which which is an issue that's come up from several places. Um, and so they recommended a series of funding. I don't have the list in front of me, so I can't speak to all of them. One of them is a, a street worker who would be out at night helping people. The idea is to, is to sort of meet people where they're at, he help get them to the services they need, because everyone's story is slightly different, uh, and, and build a level of relationship and trust with folks. Uh, so that's the biggest expense. Isn't of, the licensed social worker doing that as well? It's not really the same thing. And uh, if we had more time, I could go into right. length into the differences. Um, there is a we, we did prepare a memo, which is available publicly, about the differences between the two. But they really are completely different. Uh, it seems on the surface of it they'd be the same, but they're really not. Uh, and so the, the street worker is probably half of that money. Uh, there is f uh, were funds in there to extend the the operating uh, times of the shelter. I can't remember if that ended it or not because we don't know if there's going to be a shelter next year. Well, we did the ten thousand this year. This year. So if the shelter is there next year, would that translate to the ten thousand that we spent this year? Uh, well, so that was, you know, I'm I'm doing this from memory, Richard. I don't want to give you. a and, and the public the, the wrong answer. I know there part of the request was to extend the, uh, the the operations of the shelter, and part of the concern was that we did not get that request from the shelter operators, and we don't know for sure if the shelter is going to be operating in in the same manner next winter. So I think the council actually did not approve that money. As, uh, the original ask was for fifty six thousand. And they approved forty-five thousand of oh, so it. That, that slice so some it. some of those things weren't included. There were some smaller things that were included, and I I, I apologize that no, I can't no. remember them off the top of my head. But the the street worker was the biggest thing. And, you Would know, the we, street worker be working on panhandling? That's that's a concern to some. Yeah, I think the street worker would be talking to people about the impact of those kind of things, and also trying to figure out what resources those people, you know, the the folks that are doing that need and. And, and where they can be helped to make sure people are safe. You know, we have people in, in some of these freezing nights that are not in the shelter that are still out, and is there something we can do to help as, as you know, humanitarians? But also, can we seek to um, come up with alternate life circumstances for people so they don't need to be on the street? Are street? we linking with the, Ver the Vermont Department of Labor? To connect, or with temporary work agencies. Well, that's to that's essentially what happens is that the the street workers then, you know, they have a good knowledge of the various network of services provided, and, and you know, some people might need labor, some people might need mental health, some people might need substance abuse, some people might need all of it, all of it. Some people might need job training, some people just might need a house. You know, they're just uh, so, you know, I think it's really figuring out what, and 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 there are folks who choose to live that way, and, um, and that's their choice as long as they're not impeding on other people's choices. One final on house, any movement on Saban's pasture? When we talked about the grand list and growing the grand list, obviously movement on Saban's pasture would grow the grand list. Uh, I can say there are, very, there are uh, preliminary discussions going on with the landowner and the Trust for Public Land, who uh, you may recall about 10 From years ago. a long ago, time ago. Right. Had, had, Come up with a, a you know a, a design that the public generally endorsed, and, and we've since that was used a mixed use design. Well, it was the the you know the bottom half being and the residential, the top, the top was, half being right. preserved, and that that general design I call it the grand bargain, but there's no official name for it, um, has driven our zoning, our planning, uh, all of our types of things since then to to try to create incentives for that to happen. Recently, the Vermont College of Fine Arts sold an 18-acre parcel, which is part of, which was their portion of Sabin's pasture, and I think that sale has then re-stimulated interest in, well, then what could happen with the rest of the parcel? Who could be involved? What funding sources might be available? And so, the city and Trust for Public Lands and the property owner are, are talking about possibilities 
uh, what, how, how something might be structured, who might be involved. Um, so I wouldn't say there's you know movement, like there's not going to be a house up there tomorrow, but we are uh, trying to move forward. Um, there was at least one point a talk. You know, so we mentioned earlier TIF. So savings tax Patrick is, is in the tax increment finance district. So one thing that could happen is the city could could put in some infrastructure to help make housing development possible and paid back through that tax increment. And so there was at least one point talk about a possible TIF bond also in November to help move something forward. But I, you know, I don't, I don't know if we'll be there or not. Um, now again, I'm speaking as purely speculation from just a guy who lives in District Two. Uh, the distillery is not in the TIF. Correct. Would the distillery be moved into the TIF that we're across? No, you the can't. Street? So the the distillery was um, actually left out of the TIF district when it was created because it was already uh, it was already under development. So so the idea of a TIF district is you freeze the the tax benefits where they are, and then the, the new growth helps fund the infrastructure in that. And because the distillery was already under construction when we were doing that, basically we were you know. We weren't allowed to then claim its new tax growth, and so that was one sort of a state legal reason why. More importantly, um, when the the city made it had us a development agreement with the uh, distillery, which uh, again we put in some infrastructure and roads right. and those kinds of things, and all of that was predicated on the new tax revenues coming from the distillery. So even though it's not officially a TIF. We, we set the development agreement like a TIF, so we wouldn't want those tax revenues then going into another TIF district. That, that's sort of been accounted for, taking care of what we so really So that side of Berry Street, the south side of Berry Street, there's a huge building with a for sale sign on it. That would not be in the TIF? Oh, all of it's in the TIF except for it, 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 the side of Berry Street that includes the granite sheds and all of that. That's all in the TIF district up to the, the distillery. The distillery. So that would be in a TIF district. Correct. So that would not be in the general tax role. That would be in the TIF district paying for TIF projects. Correct. So other than Sabin's pasture, is there other major undeveloped land in our town that, that wouldn't be in a TIF? That so would be so available the TIF, for general purposes? Well, I mean... I'm always surprised at what people come up with. You know, the TIF district is pretty is clearly defined. It includes Sabins and the stretch down Barry Street that we just talked right. about. Now, clearly, that whole granite shed area could be ripe for redevelopment along along Barry Street. The south side. Correct, and um, especially now with the new bike path that's gone through. Um, but there are some brownfields there. There's you know need for infrastructure underneath. All of those are eligible for TIF funding. So these are the kind of things that could help create economic development. The TIF district then stretches into the downtown and, and, and comprises most of the core downtown. So there could be some infill development here and there. Obviously the hotel, uh, if, if um, the property across from the hotel, the former gas station would redevelop, that would go, that would be new TIF dollars. Outside of that, everything else is not in the TIF. So, um, you know, Crestview Meadows area, the Crestview Estates over on Terrace Street, uh, out Elm Street, all of those areas, anything in most of the residential neighborhoods, um, all would be general development without without being TIF eligible. Now, this is on the road to, to town meeting 2020, and I don't want to keep you here until the town meeting on 2020. Thank you, Bill. Uh, my for, pleasure, for Richard. Coming. Thanks for having me, and I, I hope people come out and vote. Uh, there, you know, it's important for uh, the future of your city to have your, have your voice known. And uh, we urge people to turn out on March 3rd or any time now, voting has already uh, started. See, and I'll double what Bill said, but also say, watch the other shows. I referenced the show with Donna and Connor. All of these shows are really interesting watches and informative watches. But I'll say exactly what Bill said. Get out and vote and make sure that your family and friends do because that's the bedrock of, of a community cohesiveness, is the community being out on town meeting day, enjoying it. Thank you so very much for watching.